The Legend of Zelda series has many defining traits to it, but one of the most famous ones, I'd say, is the incoherent storyline that these games supposedly share, if you ask Nintendo. If you ask me, the guy who's actually played all these games in order, I'd say that this is mostly nonsense, and that the majority of these games were made with very little thought put into how they connect to one another. That being said, a small collection of Zelda games were in fact made to be direct sequels to previous ones, picking up on where the previous game left off and hosting the same player protagonist as well. One thing that's interesting about these titles is that they always seem to be accompanied by strange development cycles, which in turn produces a game unlike any the series has seen before, for both better and worse. For some examples of this phenomenon, Zelda 2 belongs to an entirely different game genre than the rest of the series, because it was spontaneously converted into a Zelda title in the last six months of the game's development. Majora's Mask utilizes an experimental time travel mechanic recycled from a previously scrapped project in order to pad out the game's content following a rushed one-year development cycle. Phantom Hourglass completely ignored conventional game design in order to serve as a tech demo for the DS. Quality of the game be damned. When it comes to Zelda sequels, there always seems to be some limitation set by the game's development that in turn breeds innovation, and Link's Awakening, the direct sequel to A Link to the Past, is no exception in that regard. Starting as a pet project headed by programmer Kazuaki Morita, development of Link's Awakening began in earnest when it caught the eye of Takashi Tezuka, the lead programmer of Zelda 1 and game director for A Link to the Past. Tezuka became interested in the project primarily due to its creative freedom. As the second in command for the previous Zelda games, many of his more imaginative or odd suggestions for the games were shot down by Shigeru Miyamoto, who still held creative control over the Zelda series at that point. While he did eventually produce the project following its official approval by Nintendo, Miyamoto did not actively participate in the development, unlike with the previous games, thus marking Link's Awakening as the first game in the Zelda series to be developed without the input of its original creator. As such, Tezuka and his team were free to get as weird with the game as they wanted to, and boy did they revel in that newfound freedom. The desire to create something new and wholly different in the Zelda series was so intense with this title that the idea of the game's story all taking place in a dream was established pretty much from the get-go, thus allowing the dev team to get as wacky with the project as possible. One would think that with such newfound creative and narrative freedom on the programmer's part, that the story would suffer, but miraculously, the opposite was true. Link's Awakening does what Zelda 3 could not, and delivers a character-driven story with a consistent narrative and theme. It isn't the deepest or most in-depth narrative in the series, but it still manages to pack an emotional punch and leave the player with a serious moral question or two to ponder afterwards. Not only that, but the game also manages to innovate on the gameplay end of things, introducing new mechanics and creating a generally consistent and challenging set of dungeons well beyond what the series had seen up until this game's release in 1993. Combine all of that with a charming set of 8-bit graphics and the absolute best soundtrack to ever be recorded for a Game Boy game, and Link's Awakening has established a reputation as one of the defining titles in The Legend of Zelda series, an honor that the game most definitely deserves. So without any further delay, let us explore one of the Zelda series' most unique and beloved titles, starting, as always, with its beginning. Link's Awakening opens up with Link, 
a, a wakening in a foreign bed with a beautiful woman standing over him. Though she bears a remarkable resemblance to Zelda, at least according to the dialogue, I personally don't see it, she is in fact a young woman named Marin, a native to the island of Koholint, which Link apparently washed ashore on following a terrible storm that wrecked his ship. Her father Terran will give you back your shield, and point you in the direction of the beach you washed up on, which he says will likely be where you can find your other belongings. You leave the house, and that's it! The island of Koholint, and the story told therein, is now your oyster. Speaking of the story, this is the first Zelda game that actually manages to tell a character-driven narrative, instead of simply bombarding the player with piles of exposition. I will, therefore, talk about these story developments as they happen. Just as I talk about each dungeon in chronological order, so too will I talk about the story beats in the order in which they occur. But unlike with the dungeons, I will save much of my analysis of these events from a quality standpoint until the end, where I will also go over the themes of the story, how well the characters are written, and how the gameplay ties in with that narrative. But getting back to the opening, if you're familiar with some of the common tropes of the Zelda series, you may have noticed something a bit strange about the first bit of the game that I just summarized. That being the fact that the old man character who usually provides Link with his sword is now providing him with a shield instead. While that might come off as just a thoughtless subversion of a common Zelda trope, this is actually a deliberate and intelligent design choice on the part of the developers. Because the sword in this game functions as it always has. Press a button to swing it and hold it down to perform a spin attack. But the shield has actually received a rather radical overhaul compared to the previous games, and thus is handed out to the player first, so that he may accustom himself to its new functions. You see, in previous games, the shield was just a passive piece of equipment that would block certain projectiles when facing forward. Nothing special. But here, as you might notice from the way the HUD reads, the shield is an actual piece of gear that can be equipped or unequipped. Now, the player has to actually hold a button down to raise the shield and block incoming attacks, something that the many Octoroks on the way to the beach will be sure to teach him. While this may at first come off as a downgrade, it does open up the way for new possibilities. Possibilities that the newly introduced sea urchins will teach. To get past them, you'll have to use your one and only item the shield to push them back, thus teaching the player that the shield not only blocks projectiles, but can also be used actively against enemies like a weapon, a lesson that will become particularly relevant once we hit the first dungeon. Once the player clears the urchins, he can access the beach and find Link's sword, after which a talking owl will drop down from the sky and tell Link that the only way to leave the island is to wake up a creature known as the Windfish, which is sleeping in an egg at the top of Koholint's tallest mountain. In order to do that, the player will have to locate the eight instruments of the Sirens, all of which are guarded by terrifying creatures known as Nightmares that reside in the eight dungeons that litter the island. To enter the first of these dungeons, Link will need a key, located in the Forest of Mystery, which the Owl will point you in the direction of before flying off. Link will then hold his sword high, and the calm sword-searching music will transition into the classic triumphant Zelda overworld theme. signaling that the once helpless player now has the power to bend the island of Koholint to his will. And speaking of power, the sword will not only grant the player the ability to kill enemies, but will also open up exploration of the island by allowing him to cut down the previously impassable bushes, subtly teaching, first through urchins and now through environmental obstacles, that items can be used to further open up the game world and the exploration held therein. While the shield only opens up the way towards the beach, the sword will now allow access to both the the Forest of Mystery and several key locations in Mabe Village, including a shop that houses a key quest item and a well that holds the game's first piece of heart. As we can see, the way Link's Awakening designs its progression is like a fan, beginning in a singular line but then spreading out into further diverging paths the farther we get from Mabe Village. In this way, every player will experience the same beginning section of the game, which teaches key lessons about the game's rules and design, but then do the game's many options 
original and key tasks in increasingly differing orders as the game goes on. This blend of linearity and exploration within the game world is much like the Ice Palace in A Link to the Past, but on a much larger scale, blending linear design with open-ended tasks and tangents in the game world for the player to explore, should he so choose. On the subject of optional content, while there is much less to speak of in Link's Awakening when compared to the previous title, it is also a much shorter game, about half the length of A Link to the Past. Given the shorter runtime, the overworld itself is also much smaller when compared to the two overworlds from Zelda 3. But because of that, the optional content that is available packs a bigger punch. That being said, the pieces of hearts are perhaps the one thing that A Link to the Past handled better. There are only 12 of them in this title, spread out across the island of Koholint, and their difficulty in being found ranges from, really? That was it? to how the fuck was I supposed to know to look there? Some of these are way too easy to find, and others are just fucking unfair. There really is no in-between with this game. Take for example, this piece of heart. It is just sitting there. You can't get it yet because you don't have the necessary dungeon item, but as soon as you do the first dungeon, bam, it's yours. This isn't the only example of bad piece of heart placement either. This one is also just sitting there, and again, you can't get it. You need to obtain the power bracelet first, but as soon as you do, bam it's yours. None of these are hard to find or difficult to obtain. They simply require a certain dungeon to be completed in order to get them. On the flip side, we have this piece of shit. There is nothing to hint at this one. You just have to swim to a very specific part of this moat and dive. No dialogue pointing to it, no visual cue, no audio cue. It is just there, and you literally can't know about it without an issue of Nintendo Power or the internet, but only one of those things were readily available in 1993. My point point is, the pieces of hearts are the most inconsistent set of side content in this game, and their piss poor locations are the main culprit of that. Luckily for Link's Awakening, the pieces of heart, for the first time in a Zelda game, are only one of two collectibles available for the player to seek out and be rewarded with for locating. The second set of collectibles are the seashells, and these things are a perfect example of how collectibles in a video game, any video game, should be optimally handled. I'm gonna get a lot of for this next statement, but fuck Breath of the Wild and its stupid ass collectibles. For those of you who've never played Breath of the Wild, here's my main problem with it. There are 900 fucking Korok seeds spread across this entire goddamn map, and you have to collect every single one in order to 100% the game, and yes, collecting them all is just as terrible as it sounds. There are only 8 puzzles involving these things, copy and pasted over 110 times each, which means they go from being kinda neat to spot at the game's beginning, to being becoming a chore by the 50th time you do it. So imagine my dismay when I learned that there were another 850. On top of that, you stop getting rewards for collecting them after you find 451 of them. Yet you still have to collect the last 449 in order to receive the ultimate prize and complete the game. And to add insult to injury, your ultimate reward for collecting all 900 seeds is a literal piece of shit, not a joke, as if the devs were deliberately trying to make the task of collecting all Korok seeds as deliberately demoralizing as possible for the player. I don't care if this was meant to be a joke, it's not cool. Don't put it in your game. So how do the seashells succeed where Korok seeds fail? Well, first of all, there are only 26 of them, and second, you only need to collect 20 to receive your prize, meaning that each player can collect a different set of 20 seashells based on how they explored the game world, and still have enough to receive their prize. This was the intent behind the 900 Korok seeds of Breath of the Wild, except in that game, you still needed to collect all 900 to 100% the game, whereas with the seashells, the last six will disappear from the game world the moment the player turns in his set of 20 or more and receives the associated prize. Which brings me to the next point. Your ultimate prize for collecting the seashells is actually worthwhile. An upgraded sword that deals double damage and shoots a sword beam at full health, just like the Master Sword. Considering that it's the only sword upgrade in the game and the last few bosses can be quite difficult to kill without it, this is a fantastic reward that makes the task of finding seashells all the 
more worthwhile. Whereas the literal pile of shit you get in Breath of the Wild feels like the devs are laughing in your face because you had the gall to actually play their game. And finally, the seashells manage to all feel unique, well hidden, or well guarded, thus making the task of finding them fun to engage in, and not just a means to an end like in Breath of the Wild. Thus, the seashells in Link's Awakening serve as one of the best sets of optional content in the entire series, managing to bring a wide variety of secrets to explore in the overworld while also not oversaturating it with meaningless content. And with the requirement of collecting all 26 being nixed in favor of a more flexible goal of 20, no player will be forced to scrounge around the map looking for that one collectible they missed like is so common in other Zelda games. This kind of design is a large part of what makes the world of Link's Awakening so enchanting for new players. It was created with the intent of making a well-designed set of dungeons and story beats for the player to experience, but it is also host to so many optional tangents and secrets to explore that it still retains some of that classic Zelda exploration from previous games. The absolute cherry on top for this classic design is the overworld map, which as you may notice is entirely uncharted at the beginning of the game. This leaves so much of the mystery of the overworld intact, and also forces the player to actually go out into the world and chart it out for himself, just like in Zelda 1. One odd thing about A Link to the Past that always bothered me is that upon entering the Dark World, which is supposed to be a mysterious alternate dimension that no one has escaped from, you have a complete map with all the major locations just pinned on it from the get-go. This makes it harder to feel like the game is really the player's adventure, and instead gives the feeling that he's just on a tour at Universal Studios or something. The uncharted map you get in Link's Awakening, on the other hand, fills in as the player explores each screen of the overworld, thus allowing the player to easily track his progress, which can really help out if he's looking for a specific dungeon or collectible and needs to see where he hasn't been yet. It also preserves the mystery of the island of Koholint, which is particularly important given just how intrinsically tied that mystery is to the game's story and exploration. Given that this is a dream island, the devs took extra care to give it geographical flares that would simply not be possible on a real island of this size. For one, the environments of Koholint are quite diverse, especially given just how tiny the island is. The Forest of Mystery, which we'll look at soon, is a foggy, quiet forest filled with moblins, caves, and all sorts of secrets. Then, only a little north of that is Gopanga Swamp a piranha-infested, overgrown death trap that requires a chain chomp to make it through unscathed. On top of that, there's a desert, a land of the undead filled with guineas and zombies, a giant waterfall and river system in the east, and so much more that all should not be able to fit on one tiny island. But those are just the environments. As far as the man-made stuff goes, there's all sorts of crazy locations, such as the village inhabited entirely by talking animals, an abandoned castle in the middle of the island, and an honest-to-god health spa ran by a lady named Crazy Tracy who will offer a very suggestive service in which she rubs a special medicine all over Link. Yeah, when I said earlier that the devs went crazy with their newfound creative freedom, I really meant it. The last thing of note about the overworld is the minigames held therein, of which there are only three this time around, but that's mostly a good thing given just how inconsistent A Link to the Past set of six were. The first of these is the Trendy Game, which is a claw game played for several different prizes, including money and consumables, as well as a key item in the case of a Yoshi doll. You have to move the claw with the A and B buttons in in order to pick up your prize, with the challenge being about timing your grab correctly due to the moving nature of the items. Luckily, the one mandatory item you need to play the game for is just sitting there, making mastering the game entirely optional, but that being said, it really isn't that complicated or engaging after you get the hang of it. Still better than the three chest guessing games though. The next mini game is a fishing one, the first and far from the last of its kind to appear in the Zelda series. This one is kind of cool because of how the prize work. It costs 10 rupees to play, but you only get 5 for each small fry you catch, of which there are 3, all feeding near the top. The big ones are worth 20, and they're bottom feeders. So the trick is to sneak your line past the small fries at the top and get the bottom feeders to grapple on in order to make a profit. That being said, the pitiful 10 rupee profit you get from doing all that makes this game pretty lame on the face of things. Luckily, one of the big fish, the one closest to Link, also holds a piece of heart, so that makes the game worth playing at least once. The last minigame is also the most complicated, the Rapids Ride. This is a high 
high risk, high reward game that costs 100 rupees to play. The objective is to control a raft down the rapids and gather rupees along the way, hopefully making a profit by the end. Some paths are better than others, and some carry chests that hold one time rewards in the form of rupees, so the game encourages the player to play over and over again in order to maximize his reward. This is definitely the best game for making money, and since it's only available in the late game, it's pretty well balanced as well, allowing for players who neglected collecting rupees to quickly gather enough to buy a couple of endgame necessities without the need of hopelessly grinding for money, which is very important given just how conservative this game is with dealing out rupees in the overworld. All in all, the minigames on offer here require some level of practice and skill in order to master, with none of them requiring RNG like in A Link to the Past. They're far from the best in the series, but none of them are particularly offensive either. All of these factors make the overworld of Link's Awakening one of the most consistent in the entire series. The uncharted map allows for the player to truly feel like he's charting into unknown territory, and helps keep track of his progress as well. The collectibles are satisfying to find and reward the player's efforts in charting the island, with the seashells in particular being very well designed and implemented. The environments are diverse and enthralling, and really make the dream island of Koholint feel surreal and alien, while the decently designed minigames provide an optional reprieve from the main gameplay. With such a great overworld to experience, Link's Awakening is already poised to be a very decent entry into the series. And yet, none of what I've mentioned so far is even remotely why this game is so fondly remembered and so critically acclaimed. No. What makes Link's Awakening such an incredible game is two things, its top-notch dungeon design and its story. While many Zelda games have a story, few of them are as impactful and non-invasive to the gameplay as this titles. By non-invasive, I mean that the game does not tell its story entirely through dialogue or cutscenes, like Zelda 3 did, but will instead use clever undertones and hints that could be spotted during normal play that foreshadow the developing plot before it's actually put into the spotlight. In the case of Link's Awakening, this subtle form of storytelling is conveyed through the absurdity of Koholint Island and its inhabitants. What do I mean when I say absurdity? Well, for instance, once the player leaves Marin and Terran's house and takes a look around Mabe Village, several oddities involving the townsfolk will immediately make themselves clear to him. For one, talking to any of the children in Mabe Village will grant tutorials on the controls and button mapping, which isn't too out of character for a Zelda game, until the kids start becoming self-aware of the absurdity of their own statements, and then justify them by saying, don't ask me what that means, I'm just a kid. Every single one of them says that exact same line. Then there's a dude who straight up tells the player to look out for him in the mountains later in the game, since he'll get lost up there. And this is totally accurate, he does get lost in the mountains later in the game. And then his wife tells you that her baby is asking for a Yoshi doll? And if that wasn't enough of an out of place Nintendo crossover, there's also the lady who keeps a goddamn chain chomp from Mario Brothers as a pet in her front yard, as well as a talking one in the barn that keeps asking Link for some accessories to doll herself up with. From the get-go, this game is establishing that something is deeply wrong with the island of Koholint, and if the player hasn't figured it out already from the many oddities we've seen in Mabe Village, as well as the fact that the game is literally called Yume o Mirushima, which means Dream Island, yes, this game all takes place in a dream. It's pretty obvious from the get-go, given all the trippy stuff that has happened and will continue to happen throughout the entire game, as well as the many self-aware pieces of dialogue from the island's inhabitants. A smart thing about this setting is that it allows the devs to get as wacky with the game as they want, thus allowing for a game that is completely free of the established Zelda universe. The disadvantage here is that it means the player is immediately turned off from caring about the world that the game takes place in. Because of that possibility, the writers, Kensuke Tanabe and Yoshiaki Koizumi, did something quite brilliant. They made the story about the people of the island, not the island itself, because while it's quite easy easy to detach oneself from a plastic world, doing the same to a human being who expresses feelings and dreams is incredibly difficult, even if you know that person isn't necessarily real. This is part of the appeal of what it means to be human tropes in media, because when you really think about it, self-awareness is kinda the only true marker of us being able to know that we're real. In the words of Descartes, I think, therefore I am. 
What then separates the people in this dream world from the people in the real world? Sure, the NPCs say weird things, but so do the ones in A Link to the Past, the only difference in that title being their complete lack of self-awareness or wit. But with characters like Marin, who I'll talk more about later, there exists more humanity in them than even the supposedly real characters from the previous games. What I'm trying to say is that while stories set inside of dreams generally have great disadvantages to their storytelling capabilities, Link's Awakening manages to circumvent these issues by focusing on a character-driven story with some real heart to it, though much of that will only pop up by the midpoint of the game. So while the core of this game's story will come later, the initial setting works to open up the gameplay to some wonderfully wacky stuff, as we'll soon see going forward. The first stop on Link's journey to wake the windfish is the Forest of Mystery, a foggy set of woods that is home to many dangerous moblins, as well as the tail key needed to enter the first dungeon. Inside the forest, the player will find a raccoon that will refuse to let the player enter deeper into the woods, using magic to jumble the geography and keep him from moving forward. To pass, you need to sprinkle some magic powder on him, and while there is a whole scripted section of the game where Link acquires it via finding a forest toadstool and giving it to an old witch, just just like how he acquired the powder in A Link to the Past, the devs actually left a loophole in here for returning players to use in order to pass it up. You can actually win some magic powder over at the trendy game I talked about earlier, which allows the player to actually skip the beginning quest entirely, a super cool option for returning players who just want to get right to the dungeon, or even the odd first time player or two who manages to figure it out for himself. No matter how the player chooses to do it, sprinkling the powder on the raccoon turns him back into Terran, who will state that the whole whole thing was a wild mushroom trip and he's grateful for Link's help in sobering him up. He leaves and the tail key is now Link's for the taking. With the tail key in hand, the first dungeon, Tail Cave, is now ready for the player to tackle. As I mentioned earlier, the dungeons on offer in this game are some of the best in the series, and more broadly, some of the best level designs in gaming history. And this very first dungeon is no exception in that regard. It's rather open-ended for being the first dungeon, especially when compared to most other Zelda games. But it's still structured well enough to provide a good tutorial on several common dungeon tropes we'll see be used throughout the game. At the very beginning of the dungeon, two paths will be presented to the player, one heading west and the other heading north. Both will have to be traversed eventually as the dungeon only provides three keys with which to unlock its three doors, but the choice is the player's as to where he wants to go first. Going west will present two foes for the player to face off against, hardhat beetles, the same ones from A Link to the Past, who can only be killed by being knocked off a ledge. Doing so will provide the player with a key, and while all this is well and good for returning players, one might wonder at this point, how is a new player? one who has never played a Zelda game before, supposed to know how to kill these things, or how killing enemies can net keys in the first place. Well, if this were a link to the past, the answer to that question would probably be, fuck you, go play Zelda 1. But Link's Awakening, on the other hand, actually has a caveat for that exact type of player. You see, the very next room after the hard hat beetles holds the compass, and a pop-up text will tell you what it does, including its newest feature, a little chime that will play whenever Link enters a room that holds a key. And because this room with the compass is a dead end, the player will have to immediately turn around and go back the way he came. Thus, if the player didn't kill the hard hat beetles in the last room, and therefore didn't get the key they drop, he will now be immediately told by the compass, hey, there's a key in this room, go get it. Thus, this very first dungeon manages to teach the player several key components to the game's dungeon design in all but a couple of rooms. That keys are vital to completing dungeons, so always grab them. That the compass will be of immense help in finding these keys, especially the hidden ones like in this example. And that enemies should always be killed rather than avoided, lest the player miss out on a hidden key or other goodie. This is an example of that classic intelligent design from Zelda 1's dungeons that has been so unfortunately absent from the previous two games. And if this little beginning section wasn't enough of an indicator of what's to come, then I'm happy to tell you that this entire first dungeon is full of subtle, offhand game tutorials just like this one. The other path presented at this entrance, the northern one, will in itself provide another two branching paths for the player to follow, but not before presenting a very obvious button in the center of the room for the player to push. Doing so will provide a key, which is a smart way to 
to make sure that even the players who chose to go down this northern path will know to be on the lookout for keys. Both the western and eastern paths from this point will lead to the Tail Cave's large central room, with several points of interest for the player to explore. The third key is in the center of the room, as well as the Nightmare Key, this game's equivalent to the Big Key on the second floor. Unfortunately, it, as well as the path to the boss room, is blocked off by a series of pits that the player can't yet traverse, but there are still several paths for the player to take, two of which are optional. The first of these paths leads to a room with the stone tablet, a brand new dungeon item that will reveal hints at stone slabs such as this one. Gathering the tablet and reading the dungeon hint is entirely optional, but it usually reveals a key secret to the dungeon that can be quite difficult to figure out on a first time playthrough. The other optional path to take is this bombable wall located to the west, which the player can destroy through the use of bombs, if he bothered to buy them. Behind it lies a treasure chest with a seashell, a well-deserved reward for players who take the time to explore the entirety of this dungeon. You can always come back here at any point, but it is super cool that this secret is always available to find, even long before the game teaches the player how to use the bombs. The last path available to the player is the one that holds the dungeon item, but to get to it, the player will have to first kill the spiked beetles in this room. They're invulnerable to Link's every attack, though, so how the hell does the player figure out how to kill them? Well, remember the stone slab from earlier? And look at what's in this room. Another stone slab. Hmm. Putting the tablet into the stone slab, we are told to, quote, overturn the spiked ones using the shield. So raising our shield, we find that it flips the beetles onto their now exposed bellies, allowing the player to kill them. Of course, the game has already taught the player how and why he should use the shield at the beginning of the game, so this isn't entirely impossible for the player to discover on his own. But it's important that the game teaches the player the utility of these hints early on, so that when they begin to provide more necessary hints near the end of the game, he won't just skip over all of them, which is a tendency that the boring more obvious hint tablets from A Link to the Past would foster with its player base due to their complete lack of utility, except in one very important case. Killing the beetles will reveal a set of stairs, which will drop the player into a 2D side-scroller section that bears some similarity to Zelda 1's basements. The key difference here is that, while Zelda 1 only used its basements to hold key items or serve as quick transportation across a dungeon, Link's Awakening instead fully fleshes out these basements into full-on 2D platforming challenges with enemies to boot. And before some smartass in the comments says something like, what, is Zelda ripping off Mario now? <laughs> I'd like to just say that that claim is ridiculous. These platforming sections are absolutely nothing like Mario's. Okay, well, anthropomorphic mushrooms aren't exclusive to the Mario series. Well, that could just be a Venus flytrap. Okay, they're Mario enemies, but seriously, these platforming sections are really great, changing up the pace by providing 2D platforming challenges for the player to overcome. The only problem is that Link can't jump until the very next room where the player is provided his first dungeon item, the Rock's Feather. Not only will the Rock's Feather allow Link to jump in the side-scroller sections, but it will also allow him to do the same during normal play, both inside and outside of the dungeons. All the many pits you've been seeing both in this dungeon and outside of it, all are now traversable with the Rock's Feather, just so long as the gap doesn't exceed two tiles. As an added bonus, the Rock's Feather also acts as a dodge button, allowing the player to jump over enemies, trap and projectiles using the Z-axis. This is the first use of the feather that's taught to the player, using this floating heart in the hallway as a teaching tool. It's unobtainable on the ground, but by jumping near it, Link will be able to grab and collect it. This is a smart way to teach the player one of the more niche uses of the jump mechanic, and is especially important given what comes next. Returning to Tail Cave's central room, the player can now jump the gaps leading to both the Nightmare Key and the Nightmare itself, but not before being confronted with this game's first mini-boss, the Spike Roller. As his incredibly on-the-nose name suggests, the Spike Roller will, uh, how do I say this without sounding redundant? Uh, attack the player by rolling a giant roller with a ton of spikes sticking out of it. Since the game has already provided the player with the Rock's Feather and taught him how to use it, he should hopefully know to jump over the roller to avoid being hit by it, and then close in with the sword to hurt the Spike Roller himself. Repeat the process enough times without dying, and the battle is won. And not only will this reveal the way forward, but a portal will open up that can transport the player from the mini-boss room to the entrance of the dungeon, and vice versa. This is a great fix to one of my biggest pet 
pet peeves from the last three games, having to retraverse the same level design over and over again after dying to the toughest hell dungeon boss waiting at the end. Trust me, it's not any fun to do this, it's just annoying, so I'm really glad that Link's Awakening added this small quality of life improvement to the dungeons. After the mini boss fight, the dungeon's nightmare is all that's left in the form of a familiar face, the returning Moldorm from Zelda 3. It's much the same fight as in that game. Don't fall off the edge, hit him in the back of the tail to kill him, and he'll get faster the more you hurt him. But there are two key differences in how Link controls that makes the fight feel much better than in A Link to the Past. For one, hitting his hard shell will bounce the player back a bit, making missed hits more of a risk than in the last game, where there were essentially no consequences. And the second difference, the Rock's Feather. Being granted the ability to jump over the Moldorm to avoid his attacks gives the player a lot more agency in how he can take down the Moldorm without being forced off the ledge, thus making a loss feel more like it's the player's fault, and less the design of the fight. That increased freedom of movement makes this version of the fight feel much better, thus capping off this first dungeon on quite the high note. When returning to Mabe Village, the player will be told by the village kids that something terrible has happened. Madam Meow Meow's prized pet chain chomp, Bow Wow, has been dognapped by moblins living near Tall Tall Heights. As it so happens, Bow Wow is also the key to traversing Gumponga Swamp, where the second dungeon is located, so a rescue mission it is. This game is full of several in-between story moments just like this, which not only serve to endear the player to the game's characters, but also as a small break from normal dungeon diving. With the rock's feather, the player can travel to the Moblin's cave near Tall Tall Heights, where he will face off against a gauntlet of enemies, ending in a pre-dungeon boss fight, a new concept for the Zelda series. The Moblin chief you'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with here is a good start on that front. He chucks javelins like a normal normal moblin, but will follow that up with a swift charge that can devastate the player's measly four hearts. The design of his attack pattern is actually a lot smarter than it sounds, because if the player uses the shield, blocking the javelins will be a piece of cake, but then dodging the moblin's charge is next to impossible. Using the rock's feather, on the other hand, is much riskier, since you need to time your jumps perfectly four or five times in a row to avoid getting hit by the javelins and the moblin. This is where the game's two equipment slots come in handy, because if the player thinks ahead for this fight, he can equip both the shield and the rock's feather, allowing him to block the javelins and jump over the moblin, then bust out the sword to whack him to death. These dual equipment slots, which allow the player to use whatever two items he wants, even in lieu of the sword, are one of Link's Awakening's most unique mechanics, and a large part of why this game stands out amongst its peers. This fight in particular is designed to be most easily beaten by a player who takes full advantage of this mechanic. But as we'll see soon enough, this kind of design is going to be utilized and developed again and again throughout the entire game. After killing the boss and saving Bow Wow, the player can head straight to Gobonga Swamp, where he can use the Chain Chomp to eat away at the swamp's impassable terrain, finally allowing him entrance into Bottle Grotto. Bottle Grotto starts off by immediately piquing the player's interest, with a room filled with nothing but pots and a single chest. Given that the player can't yet lift heavy objects, which the game will tell the player up front, this is an immediate sign as to how this dungeon's item will expand the player's abilities. The very next room contrasts this by introducing a new type of puzzle utilizing an old item, the magic powder. By sprinkling the powder on the unlit torch sconces, they'll light up and open the locked door leading deeper into the dungeon. From there, switch puzzles, returning from Zelda 3, make their first appearance, requiring that the player hit a switch to lower and then raise a set of fences. Unlike in Zelda 3, where the switches were really only utilized as a central mechanic in the Tower of Hera, Link's Awakening will instead build off these switches in every dungeon hereafter, until the penultimate dungeon finally utilizes them as the central mechanic. Here, the puzzles utilizing these things are simple, but teach the player their mechanics without interrupting the flow of the dungeon too much. Eventually, the player will face off against the Hinox, this dungeon's mini-boss. And while he isn't exactly the most intelligently designed boss, given that he just throws bombs and charges at Link, he is still extremely dangerous due to his high damage output. Not a great mini-boss, but hardly offensive either. Moving on from him, a brand new type of enemy will be introduced, the Vacuum Mouth. He sucks in any and all actors on the screen, be they friend or foe, and can make traversal quite difficult, since they're 
always placed in rooms with several strategically placed pitfalls. Like the Switch puzzles, these things will continue to appear with greater frequency as the game goes on. Eventually, the player will reach the end of this long gauntlet and receive the power bracelet, thus allowing him to pick up the pots blocking the way to the Nightmare Key, the optimal chest at the beginning, and finally, the Nightmare himself, Genie. So, to be fair, this fight starts off rather bad, as it commits one of my cardinal game design sins by telling the player how to kill the boss before he even has a chance to figure it out for himself, since Genie will childishly taunt that he can't be killed as long as he has his bottle. At least in the case of a boss fight, the challenge of actually pulling off the necessary steps needed to win is still present, since Genie will throw fireballs and charge at the player. But it's still kind of sucky that this hint is even in the game to begin with. After breaking the bottle, he'll enter his second phase, where he'll create an after image and circle around the player while dishing out magic attacks. If the player is not quick in taking him down once he finishes his little taunting dance, this phase will kill him pretty quickly. So this fight's still a real challenge, especially given just how few hearts the player will have at this point in the game. It's an okay boss fight, but certainly nothing special. Despite that, Bottle Grotto is still a good second dungeon, continuing to introduce future staple dungeon mechanics while being being well designed in its own right. It's definitely one of the weaker dungeons of the game, but that's actually a compliment when talking about this game's incredible lineup of level designs. Before we go any further with talking about the dungeons though, I want to quickly talk about a brand new quest archetype that Link's Awakening adds to the Zelda formula. Trading sequences. Now, even if you've played a Zelda game before, that term might sound totally foreign to you, which is understandable given just how few Zelda games even have one of these. A trading sequence in the context of a Zelda game is essentially a main slash side quest in which the player must acquire an item, generally a rather easy to obtain one, and then give it to an NPC who needs it. In return, the player will receive another item, and then must repeat the trading process until the very last NPC gives the player a super OP reward for his efforts. The challenge to this quest is in finding out which NPC wants what, which requires talking to several different characters and listening to any hint as to something they might need down the line. As such, this type of quest rewards players who explore the overworld thoroughly and endear themselves to these NPCs, which makes it a perfect fit for Link's Awakening, a game which tries its hardest to endear the player to Koholint's inhabitants. Remember that lady with the five kids who said her baby was asking for a Yoshi doll? Well, if you follow her logic and buy her baby a Yoshi doll, she'll reward Link with a pink bow in return, thus beginning the trading sequence. This trade might seem obvious, and it is, but trust me when when I tell you that it is very easy to miss these hints or simply forget who wanted what if you're not writing it all down or using a guide. Personally, I don't think these trading sequences are super great. I understand the intent is to attach the player to several characters and reward him for exploring the overworld, but it just isn't the most engaging way to do either of those things. Good dialogue and well-written character development is a far better way to achieve the same goal with regards to the story. Which, mind you, this game already has in the form of Best Girl Marin. But the pieces of heart, and especially the seashells, are a way better way to incentivize the player to get out there and explore the overworld. I get that it's a good way to attach tasks to characters without adding in a bunch of meaningless side quests. And believe me, I'd take a trading sequence over 10 fetch quests any day. But it's still a lesser solution to that conundrum than designing several unique quests of their own design. Which this game also does. And speaking of, in order to get into Key Cavern, the third dungeon, the player will need to complete a side quest for a character named Richard, who lives in a villa right next to the dungeon. According to him, he was once the lord of Connellet Castle, until his servants kicked him out and took over the place. He says he's willing to make a trade, five golden leaves he hid around the castle in exchange for the key to Key Cavern. Pretty simple, but getting into the castle requires that the player complete the first three trades of the trading sequence, Yoshi doll to bow to dog food to banana, in order to give that last item to Kiki the monkey, who will build a bridge for Link in return. This is the extent of the required section of the trading sequence, though the player can continue it in order to receive an ultimate prize, if he so desires. Connellet Castle itself is actually a super fun side objective to tackle. It's kind of like an easter egg hunt, with several enemies to overcome and puzzles to solve along the way. I won't dwell on each 
one, but the last two in particular are important, because they in effect teach two key mechanics that will be necessary to proceed through the next dungeon. On the second floor of the castle waits two dark nuts hidden in the walls, and while the player can see them, they won't jump out no matter what the player does. That is, unless he bombs them. Now, returning players will likely have no issue figuring this out. Bumble walls are pretty much the meta in Zelda 1, and was required throughout A Link to the Past as well. But up until this point, bombs have been entirely optional items that only led to collectibles like rupees and seashells, meaning that new players will likely have absolutely no idea how bombs work. How then would a new player know what to do here? Well, at the very end of the castle lies a room with several pots, and underneath one of them is a set of ten bombs. Hmm. This serves as the necessary hint that should prompt the player to blow up the walls, exactly like in Zelda 1, where Dungeon 2 taught how to use bombs in a nearly identical way. The other lesson that the player is taught is one regarding the power bracelet. In the room with the pots lies a closed door, one that holds the last golden leaf behind it. Trying the bombs on it will do nothing, but given the sheer number of pots in the room, it should eventually become rather obvious what must be done in order to open the door. Thus, Connellet Castle serves to teach the player how to use both a new piece of equipment and an old one in a brand new way. And this isn't random either, because the very next dungeon will make key use of both of these new tools. Collecting the five golden leaves will prompt Richard to give the player the slime key, with which he can now enter Key Cavern. Key Cavern immediately demands that the player remember the lessons he learned in Connellet Castle, as the very first door needs to be opened by throwing a pot at it. From there, the dungeon starts out quite linear, and literally so, as you can see from this dungeon map, though a couple of branching rooms will tease the player's curiosity. Both of them hold chests which can't be accessed yet, requiring that the player remember these locations and then backtrack to them later on to receive their rewards. Once the player reaches the end of the linear hallway and enters through some stairs, the level design will do a complete 180 by presenting the player with a choice of four locked rooms to enter, and receive only a single key with which to open them. Only one of these rooms is the correct choice, in that it leads further into the dungeon, but there is still value in exploring these other rooms, which will all provide another key with which to open another door. The western room is admittingly just a trap room, but the southern room will provide extra bombs, which will be very useful later on, and the northern room holds the one and only switch in the dungeon, which can allow the player to enter one of the previous hallway's extra rooms and receive 200 rupees. Doing all of this is entirely optional and it's easy to miss if the player chooses the right room from the get-go, since you'll have to backtrack to discover all of this. But it's another great way to reward thorough exploration of the whole dungeon, whether it be now or later. Continuing on, the final set of rooms all create one giant floor that the player will have to navigate through. First, though, he'll have to fight the mini-boss. Two Dodongo snakes. And yes, that's actually what they're called according to the wiki. The fight here is actually kind of easier when compared to Zelda 1, because they move like slugs and the player has almost five times as many bombs as in that game. If this were the extent of the Dodongo fights in Link's Awakening, I would be very disappointed. But luckily these things do get further developed as the game goes on. In this dungeon though, yeah, the fight kind of sucks. Nonetheless, killing them all will open the way towards the Pegasus boots, allowing Link to solve the rest of the cavern's puzzles without impediment. Speaking of which, let's talk about something I've been alluding to up until this point of the video, how great the equipment system in this game is. As I've mentioned before, the A and B buttons can be mapped to any two pieces of equipment, and be used independently of one another. Sword and shield, rocks, feather, and power bracelet, whatever you want. But some items can actually be taken a step further, and combined with other pieces of equipment to do something completely new. Take for example the bow, which is an optional item available for sale in Mabe Village. It shoots arrows, which are pretty strong on their own, but if you fire an arrow and place down a bomb at the same time, you get a bomb arrow, obliterating any bomb obstacle or foe unfortunate enough to be standing in your line of sight. And now, with the Pegasus boots the player just acquired, Link has his very first dungeon item that can be combined with another, the Rock's Feather. 
Jumping with the feather has, so far, only allowed Link to clear one or two tile gaps, but by building up speed with the Pegasus boots and then jumping, Link can clear as many as three pits, vastly increasing the range of his jumps, and the places he can go in the overworld. Besides that, the Pegasus boots will also grant Link the ability to smash through crystals, further opening up his traversal options. The final task to make it to the Nightmare Room is to collect the keys. Yes, plural, because besides just the normal Nightmare key we're used to acquiring, this dungeon in particular requires that the player locate four small keys in order to open the way to the Nightmare's Lair. To find them, the player will have to use his newfound Pegasus boots, but also use environmental clues to find bombable walls within the dungeon. One such clue has the player spot a giant arrow painted on the ground that literally points to the wall. And look, I know what you're thinking, but I swear that this is much less obvious when you're playing the game on a tiny Game Boy screen with no color like I did. Sure, it doesn't make it any less obvious for anyone playing this on an emulator, but I do think it excuses it from being called poor design, and is instead just a case of the original context being missed when it isn't being played on the original hardware. I can attest personally that the detail is much less noticeable on the original console and cartridge. The next bomb puzzle aged much better by contrast. The normal crack that is used to denote a bombable wall is missing, but one can still figure out what to do by climbing up the stairs and looking into these rooms, where the player can see the room with the chest hidden behind this bare wall. It's up to the player to put the two and two together and blow up the wall, and personally, it's one of my favorite bomb puzzles in the entire series. It's not too obvious, nor is it too vague, and I always seem to forget it each time I come back to this game and have to figure it out all over again. Through these bomb puzzles and other such challenges, the player can drudge up the remaining small keys and the nightmare key, allowing access to the nightmare's chamber where we find nothing except for a few zoles dripping down from the ceiling. Again, this boss will taunt the player, though at least the answer to getting him to come out isn't being explicitly given. The player will have to ram Link into the walls using the Pegasus boots, which will cause the Nightmare himself to fall from the ceiling, which is where he was actually hiding this whole time. Later Zelda games will build better on this concept, by which I mean they don't have the boss openly taunt the player. I get that all this is building to a dramatic reveal later on, and we'll get to that, but it still doesn't excuse how terrible it is to have your bosses scream out their weaknesses at the beginning of the fight. The rest of the fight from here is all well and good though. The player will have to break the nightmare in half by sprinting into his midsection at full speed, then basically fight two bosses at the same time, who will then try to stun the player by ground pounding and then will charge him to deal damage. It's a pretty neat fight overall, even with this little hiccup at the beginning. As a whole though, Key Cavern is a great dungeon, beginning simple but quickly fanning out until it ultimately becomes a scavenger hunt for the rest of the dungeon's keys, and then ending with a pretty decent boss who forces the player to use his new dungeon item in a creative way. At this point in the video, you're probably expecting me to talk about the next in-between side quest that needs to be completed before the next dungeon, and while I would commend you for your sense of pattern recognition, this is actually the moment where the game fans out once more and begins to lose its sense of pure linearity in regards to overworld travel, and yes, even quest order. As I mentioned earlier in the video, this game's overworld at the beginning of the game is extremely linear, only allowing the player to go retrieve a sword from the beach, but then immediately begins to branch out from there, opening up several options for the player to choose from. Well, the same now applies to this game's in-between side quests, because with the Pegasus boots in tandem with the other dungeon items the player has collected, two separate dungeon keys are now available for the taking. The Angler's Key, which leads into the very next dungeon, and the Face Key, which is used to enter Dungeon 6. You can't actually do the 6th dungeon yet, since you need the equipment found in Dungeons 4 and 5 to reach it, but the side quest associated with it can be completed whenever the player wants to. This game isn't quite as free as Zelda the one, but it at least doesn't block off the player's progress arbitrarily like A Link to the Past did, which is something I really appreciate. Since we're on the subject of doing things out of order, and since both of these side quests are unique and important to the game's overall 
overall story, I'll begin with the quest associated with the face key. In order to acquire it, the player will need to make his way through the southern face shrine ruins, which are filled to the brim with invulnerable armoses who have to be navigated past. Doing so will lead to the southern shrine itself, where a pre-dungeon boss fight will occur. The Armos Knight, returning from Zelda 3, is now a single enemy, buffed to hell and back. Like the last boss, he too can stomp on the ground and stun the player, but in addition, his armor is impenetrable without the use of a spin attack or arrow, if the player has the bow, that is. This makes the Armos Knight a deadly foe, with his only real disadvantage being his slow speed, but again, the stunning effect his stomps have can help him close that gap if the player doesn't jump to avoid it. All in all, he's a great boss, and upon his defeat, the player will be rewarded with the face key. But the key is not the only prize awaiting the player, for you see, a chamber shall open following the Armos Knight's death, revealing a room with a large stone mural. It is here where the player is first explicitly told that the island and its inhabitants are nothing but an illusion, all part of the Windfish's dream. The Owl will insist that he knows nothing about this, and that it could be a false tale for all we know. But considering that, oh, I don't know, there's a big talking owl in the mural depicting the dream, it's pretty safe to assume that he's lying. But this begins an important transition for the priority of the story. Up until this point, the goal has been to wake the Windfish. Why? To escape the island, of course, but how waking the Windfish helps Link escape the island isn't ever questioned until now. Sure, this could be chalked up to Link being a fool who doesn't question things, or just poor writing, but I think it's a little more deliberate than that. We know this is a dream, and if any of you watching have ever had a dream before, you know that the hows and whys of a dream rarely ever make sense. And more importantly, when you're dreaming, you can't even trust yourself to follow some set of consistent logic, which can lead to some really wacky plot points. You might not believe this next bit, but I once had a dream where I was an eagle god fighting my dad, who didn't even look like my dad, he looked more like God with a capital G. Then I was suddenly in the plot of Thor, a movie I don't even like or think about that often, and then went to go see Natalie Portman, a celebrity I don't even find attractive, only to find that Jake fucking Gyllenhaal was making out with her. So then I turned back into an eagle and killed him. That was a real dream. I had three years ago, and it was so fucking weird that I wrote it all down on my phone, and I still look back at it and laugh my ass off from time to time. What I'm saying is that dreams rarely, if ever, follow any semblance of logic as to how we get from point A to point B, so the fact that Link never questioned his task, or the fact that it came from a talking owl, is actually a plot point that makes a lot of sense in the context of this all being set in the Windfish's dream. But at this point of the story, we're no longer thinking about about how to do our nonsense task, which began quite innocently and with complete naivety. Now, the story begins to ask us, what are the moral implications of completing our task? As the mural states, waking the windfish will shatter the dream and all who dwell within it, like a bubble upon a needle. The island and all of its many characters we've talked to, traded with, and solved problems for will effectively be destroyed, and it will be the player's fault. Conceptually, this is sad enough, perhaps even being tantamount amount to murder if you're really sensitive about it. But even if you're fairly cold-hearted, like me, and can pretty easily say, eh, these people aren't real, so their lives don't really matter, all of that goes out the window the moment you make a personal connection with someone who would be affected by this event. And that special someone, for Link and the player both, is Marin. For the first third of the game, Marin mostly takes back seat to the rest of what's going on, saving Link's life at the beginning of the game, and singing the soundtrack's best song out in the village square. But after Dungeon 3, several key events involving Marin begin to endear us to her. First, she teaches Link her song, the Ballad of the Windfish, after he acquires the ocarina, which is necessary in order to wake the windfish himself. As she does so, she tells Link to practice it every day, and always keep the song in his heart, a sentiment that becomes more tragic once you realize that she's effectively giving the player the tool to destroy the island and her. On top of that, in order to get the angler key needed to get into our next dungeon, Dungeon 4, you'll need to employ her help in moving a fat walrus from the animal village, who's blocking the way to Yarna Desert. You'll find Marin on the beach, sadly watching the waves crashing to shore, an activity the village kids say she indulges in often. She gets excited seeing Link approach, and asks him to join her. In doing so, she'll talk to Link about how excited his appearance made her feel. She's always dreamed that there was more 
more beyond the sea, more places, more people, and to see him wash ashore gave her hope that there really is more to the world than just her little island. She says her dream is to travel the world like the seagulls, singing for people in far off lands, and it becomes readily apparent that she has quite the crush on Link, saying that finding him made her heart skip a beat, and getting embarrassed after blatantly saying that she wants to know everything about you. Hearing all of that makes it really hard not to empathize with her, and maybe even like her. She bared her soul for Link, talked about her hopes and dreams, and by waking the windfish, you're effectively ending all of that in the blink of an eye. After the player listens to her dialogue, she'll accompany him to the animal village to sing for the fat walrus and get him to move. <laughs> escort missions, am I right? No, I'm wrong. Because if this counts as an escort mission, then it's one of the most creative escort missions in gaming history. Sure, you can just beeline it to the animal village and all's good. Or you can use this as an opportunity to go on a date with Marin. The game actually hints at this with the text, you acquired Marin, maybe this is your big chance. I didn't pick up on that the first time I played this game and only found out about it when the remake came out. But yeah, you can take Marin to a large variety of locations and experience several unique cutscenes in turn. I won't list them all, but my favorites are as follows. Jumping down the well in Mabe Village, where she'll land on top of Link and apologize, playing the Ocarina arena, after which she'll absentmindedly criticize your performance out loud, before denying she said anything, and bringing her to the trendy game, which she's apparently a total master of. There are all sorts of cute interactions like this throughout the village, and upon doing several different acts, and it's all entirely optional. These are just some wonderful, discoverable character interactions that the player can look out for in order to further endear himself to Marin before having her wake up the walrus and opening the way to Yarna Desert, where he can acquire the angler's key. These endearing moments with Marin are what make her so lovable, and the work put into these little details involving her character are what make her feel so human. One such humanizing detail is in how her dreams, the one she expresses to Link directly, align perfectly with her in-game actions. She sadly watches the waves, looking over the horizon, which is probably why she was on the beach in the first place when Link washed ashore and she sings for the residents of Kohlent whenever she can, in both Mabe Village and the Animal Village, where she is well loved by seemingly everyone. Since she dreams of singing beyond the sea, it makes sense that she's already tried singing to everyone on Koholint, thus her dissatisfaction with how tiny her home island is. Not only does she act and feel more genuine than any other character in the game, but she honestly feels more real than any character from the previous games. She, and she alone, is why the ending of this game works so well, and why the moral questions it asks the player to ponder have any real effect, which is something to keep in mind as we continue forward to the game's bittersweet conclusion. After completing Marin's little quest and obtaining the Angler's Key, Angler's Tunnel itself will now be open for the player to tackle. To be honest, there really isn't much to say about this dungeon. It's short, linear, teaches no further lessons in dungeon design, and it isn't host to any good puzzles either. It's definitely a contender for the worst dungeon of this game along with Dungeon 6, which we'll get to. It starts off interesting enough with a trek down a linear path that overlooks the rest of the dungeon, which is cool, but doesn't really add much to the dungeon's design. There are a few notable chests and even a loose small key that will be teased, since the player needs the dungeon item to swim and therefore acquire these items later on. But again, there really isn't any substance to these moments beyond being somewhat intriguing. When designing linear dungeons like the Angler's Tunnel, it's important to sprinkle it with challenges and puzzles to make progression difficult, but that isn't what this dungeon does in the slightest. That is, not until we get to the mini boss, who in this dungeon is a big squid thing called Hydrosaur. What I like about this fight is in how it utilizes the room layout to enhance the battle itself. Given that there's a giant wall in the middle of the room, there essentially is no diagonal movement allowed during the fight, causing the Hydrosaur to charge in straight lines across the room in order to ram the player. There are two solutions to this. Use the Pegasus boots to outrun him, or the Rock's feather to jump over him and strike him in the behind. It's a good fight overall, and much more than I'd expect from a single mini-boss encounter. Overcoming it will net the flippers, allowing Link to swim. This will enable the player to resweep the dungeon for previously unobtainable items, like the key I mentioned earlier, and acquire the Nightmare Key via this tile puzzle. 
which is kind of the worst. Why is it so bad? Well, not because of the puzzle itself, which is simple yet inoffensive. All it entails is the player jumping on the tiles in the right pattern, which is really easy given that they sparkle when the player jumps on the right one. Really, all this requires is a little trial and error to overcome, and yet the devs thought it suitable to actually make solving it impossible until after acquiring the dungeon item. Not by making it impossible to solve without the flippers, mind you, that would actually be good. Instead, the final tile simply won't activate until after the player gets the flippers. This is the dungeon design equivalent of an invisible wall, essentially creating a roadblock with absolutely no finesse or explanation beyond, this is a video game, go fuck yourself. And guess what? This is the only puzzle in the whole dungeon. So yeah, are you starting to see why this dungeon is so bad? Well then get ready because that's only half the problem here. Completing the previous puzzle will open the way to the nightmare key and combined with the small keys from earlier in the dungeon that can now be acquired with the flippers, the player can make it to the end of the dungeon and confront the nightmare himself, the anglerfish. But just to recap, we've so far had a simple, linear dungeon with only one noteworthy puzzle, which was handled poorly, and whose only other point of interest was a good mini-boss fight. Now not great, but not completely horrible either. So let's see how the devs chose to cap this dungeon off. Okay, do you see now why this dungeon is the worst one? Yep, you can just wail on the anglerfish with no restrictions whatsoever, killing him almost immediately. He doesn't even have an attack pattern, like legit. Some fish just swim by and that's all that happens with this fight. This is actually the worst boss fight in the entire series, hands down. Not even a competition. And for that reason, as well as the others I listed, it's definitely one of this game's most terrible dungeons. And speaking of terrible, you remember how we had a bunch of cool side quests up until now that established new characters and introduced the player to more of Copeland Island's key locations? Well, this next one isn't one of those. A ghost will randomly start haunting Link after completing Angler's Tunnel, and he needs to be put to rest before doing the next dungeon. Why? Because the game tells you to, that's why. Seriously, that's all. You just won't be allowed into any dungeons until you complete the quest and get him off your back. The process of doing so is at least quite easy. You just bring him to his house, then his grave, and that's it. You're done, and he's gone forever. There's literally no point to this quest, and while I know some might say that that criticism can apply to some of the other side quests as well, my counterpoint is this. Each side quest until now has endeared us to a new character. Bow Wow, Richard, Marin, all names we know well and will remember once the game's ending hits. This ghost, by contrast, literally has no name and is never seen or heard from again. In other words, he has no impact on the story. And since this quest does nothing to teach new mechanics, like at Connellet Castle, and doesn't have a valid explanation or urgency to it, like with saving Bow Wow, it instead comes off as contrived and forced, which is exactly what it is. The devs likely saw that there was no in-betweener for Dungeons 4 and 5, and just made something up on the spot. That's what the quest feels like anyway. This is definitely one of the weakest sections of the game, Dungeon 4 and this side quest, that is. Luckily, the game gets right back on track with its next dungeon. Catfish's Maw opens up by being entirely linear, like last dungeon. Only a single direction to choose from at the start, and it needs to be followed in order to receive a key sitting at the end of the path. The difference with the Maw is in how it uses that linearity to great effect, because, as it turns out, this beginning section is deceptive. The dungeon will fan out the moment the player enters the locked door, but besides that, this dungeon utilizes backtracking to effectively make this seemingly simple level design into to a large, player-driven scavenger hunt. On the way to the key is a 2D platforming section that utilizes physics, demanding that the player stand on one platform, use his weight to lower it, and thereby raise another platform. This is a brilliant next step, and hints at further development for these sections down the line, an observation that will be relevant quite soon. 
At the end of the linear section is the aforementioned small key that will open up the rest of the dungeon. But something of note is also here, a small room with absolutely nothing in it, barring a large painting of a skull on the floor. This will obviously stick in the player's mind since it's so odd and seemingly useless at the moment, which is important given that it will be backtracked to later on. The first mini boss, and yes, there are two mini bosses now, incremental difficulty done right my friends, will make an early appearance. He is once again a returning foe from Zelda 3, though he was only a normal enemy in that game, the Stalfos Knight. Perhaps as a result of that fact, he's kind of a coward and will literally nope out of the fight the moment Link starts winning, which is done the same way as in Zelda 3, strike his head, then follow up with bombs. In the next room, which is supposed to hold a dungeon item based on the tropes we've established up until now, is an empty chest with a note in it. The mini boss is still alive and taunts the player about having stolen the dungeon item. And so, this second act of the catfish's maw becomes a manhunt. As a result, the design of the rest of the maw is entirely non-linear, presenting several branching paths and optional rooms for the player to explore, though a fair bit of that exploration will be limited until the player kills the knight and receives the dungeon item. Which which in effect will limit the number of rooms the player will have to search for him in. As you can see, this dungeon is very carefully designed, operating in three phases of incremental difficulty. The linear search for the key, the now non-linear hunt for the knight, and then later, a full-scale scavenger hunt for the dungeon's final small key and nightmare key. This makes Catfish's Maw one of the more well-designed dungeons in the whole game, since it's a challenge that really tests the player's skill and memory. Speaking of, to kill the Stalfos Knight, the player will have to hunt for three separate boss rooms with the identical skull pattern from the first one. It'll become pretty obvious by the second or third room, which is great because while both of these rooms are situated deeper into the dungeon, the final one is near the beginning, if you remember from earlier. Yeah, that big empty room with the skull pattern from the beginning is the boss's last hiding spot. This dungeon manages to make its puzzle solving clear and telegraphed, but also hidden and spread out well enough for it to feel like it still respects the player's intelligence, which is optimally how a developer should design a puzzle. Take notes, Angler's Tunnel. Killing him will net the hookshot, allowing the player to now traverse the previously unreachable parts of the dungeon by latching on and pulling himself towards blocks and treasure chests alike. The fact that this item is acquired back near the start is quite deliberate, as it forces the player to retread these old hallways and notice all the new paths he can take. Like I said earlier, there is a second mini-boss here the Goma. Goma is actually optional though. Entering her boss room eats up a key and can be navigated around, again highlighting the freedom that the later half of this dungeon affords the player. The fight itself is much like its previous iteration in Zelda 1, that is, waiting for Goma to open her eyes while dodging her attacks. Unlike in Zelda 1, though, she doesn't just go down in a single hit, and will instead tank quite a few before dying, depending on what weapon you use to kill her with. There are three options in that regard, the claw shot, bombs, or arrows, with arrows probably being the easiest to use. This isn't a great fight, but then again, it's not required, so it really doesn't bog the dungeon down in any way either. The last task that needs to be completed before heading to the boss room is to search for the nightmare key, which is found by diving in a patch of water and then pulling a rope bridge in with the hookshot. If the player can't figure that out without a little help, then finding the stone tablet will provide the answer, which is also a bit of a scavenger hunt in and of itself, so either way, rigorous searching is required to find this key, which is a great way to cap off a dungeon that has been so intrinsically characterized by searching for objectives within its many mysterious rooms. The Nightmare himself is something called the Slime Eel, which is apparently so long that it can stick its spike tail out of a hole in the center of the room, while also sticking its head out of any one of four different holes in the wall. The objective here is to avoid his tail while trying to take an opportunity to grab at his head with the hookshot, which will pull him out in the open for the player to wail on him. I've heard complaints before, mainly just from King K's review of this game, stating that this fight is terrible because the tail can't reach the player if he just stands in the corner. If you recall, I made an identical claim in the last video regarding Vitreus, so you might expect me to agree with this criticism. I do not. My problems with the Vitreus fight, which I currently consider the second worst boss fight in the entire series, is that Link can stand at the quarter to avoid all of Vitreus' attacks, while also affording him the opportunity to kill the boss's minions with no problem, and then even the boss himself once he charges at the player. So standing in the corner and tapping the A button over and over again is a valid strategy. This is not the case with the Slime Meal, because while yes, standing in a corner will get Link out of the tail's reach, it will also prevent 
prevent him from attacking the eel in any way, shape, or form. In other words, the player must leave the corner eventually in order to actually fight the boss. This turns the corner into a safety net, but not an actually valid way to cheese the fight, like with Vitreus. Therefore, I can't say that I find King K's complaints to be valid in this instance, especially since he likens the slime eel to angler fish, which... Just, no, these are not the same quality at all. Sure, this fight isn't the greatest by any means, but it does require that the player puts himself in harm's way in order to actually win. So I don't think I understand the comparisons I've seen between this fight and Angler Fish in the slightest. They're just on two completely different levels of design quality, I'm sorry. But regardless of how the player feels about this fight, personally, killing the slime eel will net another instrument, and so it's off to Dungeon 6 we go. Assuming you've gotten the key from the Southern Face Shrine that I mentioned mentioned earlier. That is. The Face Shrine itself is unfortunately a bad dungeon that had some good ideas. Let me make this clear though, the bad dungeons in this game are still better than most of the dungeons seen in other Zelda games, but that still doesn't excuse the unfortunately poor design that manages to bog down the overall experience of this dungeon. What do I mean by poor design? Well, the Face Shrine was created to be non-linear confusing, and labyrinthian in design. Which, as you might remember from earlier videos of mine, is my favorite type of dungeon design. So how then does the face shrine fail in creating an effective labyrinthian design? Simple. Its level layout is terrible and makes navigating the dungeon completely unintuitive for the player. I've talked about this a little bit before in my Zelda 2 review, how complicated maze-like dungeons, which I usually love, can get ruined by poor design layouts. And the face shrine is an unfortunate victim of this design flaw. The dungeon starts out with two branching paths, only the left of which can be navigated through. But then it branches out further, introducing one path that leads to the dungeon item a better power bracelet, and then the small key needed to progress into the eastern half of the dungeon, as well as many other optional pathways that lead to rupees and a seashell. All of that is well and good, but it becomes a pain to navigate through because of the linear design of these room layouts. Let's say this is your first time doing the dungeon, so you don't know where to go and in what order to do things. So you head east, only to find that you hit a dead end without a small key or the dungeon item. Okay, so you waddle your ass back to the start, head west, then go north to find the small key. Cool, so now you go back to the dungeon entrance and head east again. Enter the small door and then fight the mini-boss. Great, but now you can't head in any further because you don't have the dungeon item. So now you have to go back again, head west again, and look for the power bracelet in the west wing all over again. Once you eventually find it, you have to head to the start for the fourth fucking time and finally get past those beginning roadblocks. This is what it's like to navigate a poorly designed non-linear dungeon, which unfortunately the face shrine is. Looking at just a plain map of the dungeon, it becomes easy to see what the problem is with the shrine. There is a complete lack of any intuitive way to navigate from one end of the dungeon to the other. When designing a non-linear dungeon like this, it's important to keep in mind that it needs to allow for simple, easy ways for the player to both understand where he is and get to where he wants to go. The challenge should be in the player finding out where to go and mapping out his environment, not in the act of getting from one known part of the dungeon to another known part of the dungeon. In other words, backtracking, which is a staple of such dungeons, should be designed to be as quick and painless as possible. I've said this before, but the best way of achieving that is through the use of a large central room that all parts of the dungeon attach to. The water and lake bed temples are the best examples of this, being two of my favorite dungeons in the whole series as well. But we even have an example of this in 2D Zelda, in the form of the Desert Palace from A Link to the Past. Having these 10 rooms arranged in a linear design would make navigation between them a paint, but because they're instead all attached to a large, central one, you can move between any two chosen rooms with ease. This makes the process of combing over the dungeon for missing keys much more intuitive, which is the design choice that feels sorely lacking in the face shrine. Beyond the issue of the level layout, the dungeon is also bogged down by a poorly designed set of enemies and puzzles that waste the player's time as he backtracks through the dungeon. Take the Wizrobes, for example. These are returning enemies from the three previous titles, and yet they are infinitely harder to deal with here. They cannot be killed with the sword, only by bombs or arrows, which is something the player isn't told about either, so trial and error is all you have to go on here. And it takes four goddamn arrows for them to go down. 
Besides that, they disappear in and out of frame over and over again, making it difficult to get the timing down if you're trying to use bombs. And since these two weapons are in fact consumables, you may very well run out and be unable to kill them, forcing you to farm for more or just leave and buy some in Mabe Village. Not only that, but there are four goddamn rooms filled with these things, and most of them have a door that doesn't open until you kill them, so just avoiding them is impossible in most scenarios. This grinds movement down within the dungeon to a halt and makes the act of backtracking for keys and items quite dreadful indeed. Add on to that flying tiles that need to be waited out for a door to open and a brand new puzzle that consists of throwing a chess piece over and over again until it lands upright. I am not making that up, that's a real puzzle in this dungeon and I still don't understand how it works and you have what is one of the Zelda series most dreadfully designed mazes for the player to navigate through. So, yeah, this dungeon is terrible. The nightmare waiting at the end of this hellfuck is Facade. Nice pun, Nintendo. He's pretty weak, but still not nearly as bad as Angler. His face is his weakness, and you just need to throw bombs at it to kill him. He'll throw flying tiles at Link until he runs out, and then he starts opening up holes in the floor to swallow the player up. The fight definitely gets harder as it goes on, but how long it goes on for is determined entirely by how long it takes the player to kill him, which evidently can be very quick if you know what you're doing. Not the worst nightmare fight, but definitely one of the lesser ones, in terms of enemy design. Killing him nets the Coral Triangle, and with that, only two instruments remain, both of which are located in the uncharted northern mountain range of Koholint Island. Tall Tall Heights, as the range is called, is essentially the endgame area of the overworld. Most of it isn't even traversable until after completing Angler's Tunnel and Catfish's Maw. Some last minute heart pieces and seashells are hidden in many of the optional sections of the heights, but more importantly, both the penultimate and final dungeons of Link's Awakening are located up there. The former of which, Eagle's Tower, is in the easternmost extreme of the mountain range. To enter it, though, the player needs to acquire the Bird Key, which can only be received via a little side quest. Several characters will hint at what the player needs to do for this quest, so it isn't like the task is untelegraphed or anything, but it is easily the most unguided quest of them all, which makes sense given that it's the last one in the game. You have to learn an ocarina song from, I shit you not, the antagonist of Super Mario Bros. 2, Wart, or Mamu because he's given his Japanese name for some reason. Anyway, Mamu will teach Link the frog song of soul, a song so powerfully soulful that it will raise things from the dead. Yes, that is actually the explanation Wart gives you for how this song is able to resurrect things from the dead. I know this is kind of a tangent, but I really love the animal characters that teach the player songs in this game. I mean, just take my man Monbo here, for instance. Okay, I know this is subjective, but Monbo's little dance is my favorite character interaction in the whole game. Just look at his eyes! <laughs> I love him so much. Anyway, once the player acquires the Song of Soul, he can revive Mabe Village's flying cuckoo. Wait, it's not a cuckoo? It's a rooster? So, okay, the flying rooster will then allow the player to acquire the bird key, thus allowing entrance into Eagle's Tower, one of the best dungeons in all of 2D Zelda. Eagle's Tower immediately presents several options for traversal, but unlike in the previous dungeon, these are but mere illusions of choice, as both the first room's western path and the second room's northern path will be blocked off by fences, forcing the player to go east until he reaches a stairway leading to the second floor. At the top of said second floor, the player will find a whole room filled with fences that, again, block off another path and keep a treasure chest out of the player's reach. Thus, the dungeon central mechanic is immediately made transparent to the player. Switch puzzles are the meta, and if the player wants to beat this dungeon, he'll need to solve them all. In the very next room, the secondary dungeon mechanic is introduced, a giant lead ball that the player will have to lug around and use to break the four pillars on the second floor. It's made pretty obvious, the ball is on a pedestal, the first pillar is in the very next room, and the collectible stone slab will even tell the player outright to knock the pillars down using the ball. The actual challenge of this activity comes from finding out how to get both the lead ball and 
and Link to the pillar rooms themselves, since traversal is complicated by the fact that Link can't do much of anything while he is holding the ball. Plus, the fences will actually block off some of the correct paths to the pillars, necessitating that the player solve switch puzzles along the way. Thus, to proceed through the dungeon, the player will have to find completely separate solutions to getting both himself and the lead ball across the second floor. Take for example the third pillar. The ball can easily be chucked into the pillar room with little legwork on the player's part, but Link himself cannot enter through the same way. So, the player will have to find another way around, lowering the fences, entering the right set of stairs on the first floor, surviving a trap room, and then finally making it to the room where the pillar is located. It's this wonderful synthesis of the two central dungeon mechanics, as well as the addition of several unrelated challenges like the mini bosses, the trap rooms, and the bomb puzzles that make Eagle's Tower such a wonderfully designed level, and one of my personal favorites from all of 2D Zelda. Destroying the pillars will make the fourth floor collapse into the third floor, thus making it traversable. Don't know how that works logically, but the Game Boy probably just couldn't render whatever the devs had in mind for this bit. In order to enter the third floor, one set of fences will need to be down while the other is up, with no switch immediately present to change this fact. This is a smart change up to the dungeon's previous rhythm, because it forces the third floor into a certain state, blocking off certain rooms with no way to change things immediately. Thus, the player's new goal will differentiate quite a bit from the previous two floors. Find the hidden switch on this third floor to open the way forward. It will be guarded, as it turns out, by the mini-boss, Grim Creeper. He's definitely the weakest mini-boss in the game, yes, more so than Dodongo, because all he does is order his brothers to charge at the player, who can just swat them out of the air, thus ending the fight. He then vows to get his vengeance on Link, and fucks off to god knows where, leaving the player to find the hidden switch and the nightmare key in the very next room. So with that, the way to the boss room is open, and it, just like the angler fight, takes place in a side-scroller section, but this time at the top of the eagle tower itself. Here, the grim creeper will come back and call the evil eagle to his side, and together they serve as the dungeon boss. This is actually the hardest of the dungeon bosses in the game. I find, because of a few key factors. First, just like the Moldorm fight, falling off the ledge gives him all of his health back, which usually isn't a concern until he busts out his giant gust attack that can easily knock the player off the ledge if he doesn't close the distance fast enough. Secondly, he will fly above the player's reach, making the act of hurting him impossible unless if you have the bow and are smart enough to use it. As the fight goes on, he'll start fighting less cautiously and begin to employ dive bomb attacks, which requires the player to strike at the eagle before he comes into contact with Link. Eventually, the fight will end once enough damage is done to him, but he has such a high health bar that the fight will be quite difficult, even with the Koholent Sword. This is definitely my favorite nightmare fight in the whole game. That is, until the final boss, but we'll get to him. Unlike with every other dungeon, there is no big side quest necessary to enter the final dungeon, Turtle Rock, which is probably appropriate given that it would be an inconvenience to have to trek up Tall Tall Heights all over again, and because it would likely kill the excitement that the player ought to be feeling by this point, knowing that the end is so close in sight. So instead, the in-between section for Dungeon 7 and 8 is dedicated to one last character interaction between Link and Marin, just to make sure the player remembers what he'll destroy by completing his journey and waking the Windfish. On the way to Turtle Rock, we'll find Marin stuck atop a bridge with no way down. Apparently, monsters kidnapped her and placed her up there, but all it takes for Link by this point of the game is a quick hookshot to the other side of the bridge, grabbing Marin along the way and saving her. She thanks Link and begins to tell him something, perhaps finally ready to confess her love, and... Interference by fireworks. Yeah, Terran fucks up the confession, so she just meekly thanks Link and heads back to the village. The owl will then drop by and tell Link that she came to Tall Tall Heights to sing the Ballad of the Windfish to the Windfish's Egg, and ponders if she actually meant to wake it. This is an interesting character moment for Marin, because based on her dialogue thus far, we can deduce that she knows that the only way to leave the island is to wake the Windfish, and we know that she wants nothing more than to leave the island and travel the world, even pondering the possibility of praying to the Windfish when talking to Link. Based on that, it's likely that she was indeed trying to wake him, perhaps so she and Link could leave the island together. Seeing as it failed, you have to wonder what she's thinking at this point. Maybe she was going to confess her love, or maybe she was just going to ask Link to take her with him, though those things aren't mutually exclusive. 
Either way, it gets the player thinking about Marin and her hopes and dreams all over again, and right before the final dungeon, which again might make him begin to question the moral implications of successfully carrying out his task. Regardless of that, the player will make his way to the final dungeon through the most dangerous part of the overworld, finally making it to Turtle Rock itself. While first appearing to be the same Turtle Rock from Hyrule, which is perhaps a bit of Link's memory slipping into the dream by this point, the real Turtle Rock will turn out to be an actual rock shaped like a turtle, which then turns out to be a turtle hidden under the rock, who will immediately attack beginning a pre-dungeon boss fight. Yeah, the devs actually made the entrance of the final dungeon into the pre-dungeon boss itself. Super rad idea if you ask me. This fight is actually similar to the Gliok boss fight from Zelda 1, since he'll extend his neck to snap at Link and shoot fireballs when he's out of range. But if the player has the Coholent sword by this point, it's actually a pretty easy fight. Killing him will unveil the entrance to the dungeon itself, ready for the player to tackle one last time. Turtle Rock, much like its equivalent in Zelda 1, is an open-ended labyrinth filled with optional content and secret passageways galore. Whereas the Face Shrine was one of the worst examples of non-linear dungeon design in the whole series, Turtle Rock is instead one big love letter to all the design choices that made Zelda 1's labyrinths so great. Illustrating that point is the nature of the small keys, of which there are seven, but only four of which are necessary to collect in order to beat the dungeon. For instance, a player can go into the west wing of the dungeon, collect two keys in the compass, use them to enter the northern section of the dungeon, then blow a hole in this wall using a bomb arrow and jump in, saving the need to use several small keys by skipping over several locked doors. Or, of course, a player can just collect all seven keys and use them on any and all locked doors he might encounter. This freedom allows for a renewed sense of player choice in how one tackles the dungeon. And unlike with the face shrine, the layout of Turtle Rock enhances that freedom with its brilliant level design. For instance, the very first room the player walks into will present three paths, all of which are intertwined with one another, meaning that the player can enter through one path and end up returning to this room through another, a luxury not afforded by the Face Shrine's more linear design. Continuing this trend in the room north to this first one is a large central room with lava all around. While this might seem impossible to navigate at first, the reality is that the player's options couldn't be any greater, for it is here where the player is introduced to the rolling rock. The player can figure out how it works just by wiggling the d-pad around, but even so, there is a stone slab that will give instructions on how to control it later on. By tapping the d-pad in any one direction, the rolling rock will in turn follow that order and leave a newly created created path in its wake. This allows the player to effectively create his own path through this lava infested room, thus granting him several new options for traversal. There are three paths in total one of which leads to the dungeon map and a staircase that transports the player deep into the east wing of the dungeon, another of which leads to the staircases leading to the nightmare key and nightmare itself, as well as the switch needed to lower the fence blocking off the dungeon item, and the last of which leads deep into the northern section of the dungeon. Combined with the two paths presented in the previous room, this leaves five separate paths for the player to choose from at the very beginning of the dungeon, easily making this one of the most non-linear level designs in the entire Zelda series. All of this non-linearity would be worthless without an equally non-linear goal for the dungeon to leave the player with, and luckily, Turtle Rock delivers on this front as well. As I mentioned earlier, only four small keys are necessary for the player to collect, though he can get more if he really wants to explore the entire level, which would be a good idea due to some of the awesome goodies this dungeon hides. For one, several hundred rupees line the dungeon, all waiting for the player to grab up. But just like in A Link to the Past's Turtle Rock, there is an even greater reward waiting in the form of a final piece of heart, which is located outside the dungeon, this time on the roof, where the fourth and final fast travel point is also located granting the player a quick path to and from Mabe Village in case he needs anything. All of that stuff is optional though. As I said, the real goal is a simple, non-linear one. Collect a minimum of 4 out of 7 keys and use them to get the magic rod which will grant access to the rest of the dungeon. How does it afford the player that ability? Well, the magic rod shoots out a blast of magic with a flame effect at the end of it, exactly like its appearance in the first game. 
This allows the player to melt ice blocks located in the side-scrolling sections that lead to the Nightmare Key and the Nightmare's Lair. Which means that to beat the dungeon, all the player has to do is get the dungeon item. From my playtesting of this level, I found that nearly half the rooms in this dungeon are entirely skippable. This makes Turtle Rock one of the most legitimately free and open-ended dungeons in the entire series. And combined with its extreme difficulty, this makes for what is easily one of my favorite dungeons in the entire series. Speaking of difficulty, let's talk about the enemies of this dungeon. I saved this part for last because unlike the other dungeons, Turtle Rock has some, oh, I don't know, six mini bosses? Yeah, if you thought this dungeon would be easy because most of it is optional, you would be mistaken because this one is definitely a hell march. Even the normal enemy encounters are tough. The dungeon starts off by introducing the Vire, who is easily the toughest non-boss enemy in this game, since he can and will attempt to avoid every attack the player throws at him. He also shoots off some nasty magic blasts, and will only rarely charge in, making his death a difficult feat to achieve. Gibdos are also present, and just as always, they're tough as nails, taking some 4 or 5 hits from the Coholent Sword to down. I don't even want to imagine how hard they are to kill without it. But then, as I said, there are still the mini-bosses to deal with. Most of them are repeats from earlier dungeons, the Hinox, the Spike Roller, and the Rover to name a few. None of these fights are different than their earlier encounters, but the same cannot be said of the Dodongo or Hydrosaur fights. The Dodongo fight, which I said earlier was in need of a serious upgrade now gets that, in the form of a raised balcony from which the player must throw his bombs from. This makes the fight much harder, since the player can no longer just place the bomb in front of the enemy's face. Instead, he must calculate the trajectory of his bomb throws just right, so that the Dodongo crawls into it before it explodes. Definitely a much better use of the Dodongos than in their first appearance, which is quite a commendable feat for what is normally one of the poorest designed bosses in the Zelda series. The Hydrosaur also gets an upgrade, since its fight now takes place near a giant lake of lava with gaps between the paths that the player must jump over. This adds some environmental challenge to the fight, forcing the player to not just avoid the Hydrosaur, but also pay close attention to the floor so that he doesn't fall into the lava. The final mini boss is a brand new one the Blano. He's definitely what I would consider the low point of an otherwise airtight dungeon. He can only be hurt with the sword, though not head on since he deflects any hit to his front side. So there isn't any real strategy to this fight other than wait for him to charge up a punch, then quickly hit him from behind. He's the last of the mini bosses the dungeon has to offer, and he'll reward the player with the magic rod, allowing access to the final dungeon boss this game has to offer, Hothead. Hothead is pretty weak, all things considered, he just needs to be struck with the fire rod over and over again until he dies, which takes a bit because of his tendency to hide in the lava that envelops the boss room. That being said, getting hit by him will hurt the player for some 4 hearts of damage, which is pretty massive considering the minimum amount of hearts the player will have is 10, and the max is only 13 meaning that only 3 or 4 hits will kill the player, assuming he doesn't have some secret medicine, that is. This leaves very little room for making mistakes, but as I said, it's quite difficult to lose here since the method of killing Hothead is so simple. Once he's dead, the final instrument will be Lynx for the taking, and all that's left to do is wake the Windfish and end the dream world of Koholint once and for all. The player can take this final moment before waking the Windfish to gather whatever collectibles he wants, ready himself for the final boss fight, or even just say goodbye to the island's many colorful inhabitants, of which some like Marin will have unique dialogue awaiting for them to send the player off with. But whether he likes it or not, the player's only way of finishing this game and getting Link off the island is by waking the Windfish, so it's off to the egg we go. The owl will tell Link to play the Ballad of the Windfish using his ocarina, and when he does, a wonderful little performance will play.
Can I just say that the music in this game is all superb? I mean, seriously, you wouldn't believe it, but this is the first Zelda game that gives each dungeon its own unique theme, and it was on the fucking Game Boy. Do you know how hard it's been for me to edit these hour-long reviews with only 20 minutes of music to use? Thank you, Link's Awakening, for the amazing and varied soundtrack. I can't say it enough. And yeah, Ballad of the Windfish is my favorite Zelda song. I know, it's not Koji Kondo who composed it, blasphemy, you say, and I get it, but I love this song so much, and it really does get me emotional whenever I hear it. And the fact that it's so intrinsically tied to the plot of this game makes it all the more appealing. Good video game music is nice and all, but when it actually is tied to the plot itself, aw oh man. That's some good shit. My love for the soundtrack aside, playing the ballad will crack the windfish's egg, allowing the player entrance into the Nightmare's final lair, where he can face off against the final boss, the Shadow Nightmares. There are a lot of great aspects to this fight, so let's start with its atmosphere. The egg itself wasn't something that the player ever likely thought of as being an actual location in the game, instead likely expecting it to simply behave like all eggs, with nothing but the windfish inside. That expectation is shattered by the dimly lit stone rooms that greet the player. Being that the game does take place in a dream, one might expect that the structure has no logic to it. But again, this expectation is subverted, as there is a giant hole in the center of the structure that leads deep into the mountain the egg sits upon. In here is a giant maze, of which the solution to is available back in Mabe Village, and a creepy track will play as he struggles to solve it, driving the player further on edge. At the end of this maze lies another hole, the final one, as dropping into it will reveal the Shadow Nightmares, who do not take the form of the Windfish's fears, as has previously been the case, but instead begin to take the form of Link's greatest fears. They start out simple enough, a giant soul will pop out of the ground and bounce towards the player. This simple beginning phase is here for a deliberate reason, to make the player start thinking about all of his old equipment, something he'll need to do throughout the entire fight. For you see, this first boss is only damaged by one obscure item from Link's arsenal, the magic powder. Yeah, you probably forgot about that stuff by now, but the dev sure didn't. Having the player cycle through all of his old gear just to search for this one obscure thing that he can harm the boss with will get him to start wondering, what else do I have that can be used to fight this boss? This will be a very important lesson going forward, because just about half of Link's items will have to be used to overcome all six phases of this boss. The next phase of this fight takes on the first of Link's personal nightmares, Aghanim, returning with a nearly identical attack pattern from the previous game. He'll teleport around the room and shoot off magic blasts towards the player, necessitating that he hit back at it with his sword. Sometimes he'll shoot blasts that can't be hit back and will need to be avoided, so you can't just stand in one spot and keep swinging. It's one of the easier phases, for sure, but it's really great to get some sort of subtle character development for Link by seeing how his previous battles still haunt him, and how his old foes coming back from the dead is one of his greatest personal fears. Speaking of which, the next phase is Shadow Moldor which acts a lot like his normal counterpart that we fought earlier in the game, at the end of Tail Cave. Except on crack, because he's a hell of a lot harder to kill, and he's erratic as all hell the moment the player first strikes at him. Other than those few changes, and the lack of holes to fall down, the fight as a whole is mostly the same as it was back in the first dungeon. Next, we have what is perhaps Link's greatest fear of all, Ganon, returning from the dead for one last duel with Link. Shadow Ganon takes on the attack pattern of Ganon's second phase from A Link to the Past, summoning fiery bats that home in on Link, throwing his trident like a boomerang, and teleporting across the room. He needs to be struck with a powerful sword blow, which either means using spin attacks or using the Pegasus boots to charge at him. This phase is my favorite of the fight, both mechanically and thematically. The idea of Link's biggest nightmare being Aghanim and Ganon returning from the dead actually makes a lot of sense, given that his fear of not being powerful enough to deal with another threat to Hyrule was exactly what drove him 
to leave his homeland in search of enlightenment in the first place. At least, that's what the manual says, but the fact that we can see his fears manifesting in the form of bosses called nightmares really drives that point home whether or not the player read the manual, which is more than I can say for Link's characterization in any of the previous titles. The fifth and penultimate phase of the fight is against a shadowy land mola, or at least that's what the wiki calls it. Really, this is just a shadowy snake that needs to be hit out of the ground, almost as though the nightmare has begun to understand how dangerous Link is and thus retreating into a less vulnerable form. Several items can be used to knock him out of the ground, including bombs, the magic rod, or the boomerang, and once the player does just that, he'll enter his final phase, Deathle. This is where the real fight starts. Those other parts of the fight are like the gatekeepers to the real boss, because Deathle hits hard. His one and only weak point is his eye, which opens and closes like with Goma, but the difference here is that he has two swinging arms that circle around his whole body. The only way to avoid them is by either not being near him, which makes hitting his eye near impossible, or by jumping over his arms with the rock's feather. On top of that, the player will have to aim for his eye, wait for it to open, then shoot it with an arrow or throw the boomerang into it. This makes the fight tough as nails, because faithfully jumping over his arms while staying within firing range is much tougher than it sounds, and since his eyes open up in random intervals, the timing for jumping, aiming, and then firing without taking any damage is nearly impossible to replicate faithfully. This is definitely a fight I had to try over and over again several times during my first playthrough, and I wager the same is true for most people who've played this game. It's definitely a high note to end the game on. The combination of the dark atmosphere, the nightmares from Link's previous adventures, the exhilarating boss theme, and the tough six-phase boss himself all makes for one of the best final boss encounters in the entire Zelda series. If the end of this game was just this one fight, it would already be fantastic, but miraculously, there is still one final linchpin to add onto this already epic adventure. Adventure, the ending to this game's story. After killing the final nightmare and entering the Windfish's chambers, the owl will officially reveal himself as the guardian of the Windfish's dreams, and explain that he failed in his task to keep the nightmares at bay, who then kept the Windfish asleep in order to perpetuate the dream world. The owl will then disappear, leaving the Windfish himself in his wake. The fish thanks Link for saving him, and goes on about how wonderful a dream world Koholint was, but explains that unfortunately, it is the nature of all dreams to end and thus, Koholint must cease to exist. But the true Koholint, he posits, is the memory of it that he and Link will hold in their hearts. So long as they live, Koholint too shall live on. And so, he and Link awaken from their dream, leaving Link to sadly float on a piece of driftwood, until he sees the windfish fly overhead, letting out a great cry. This brings a smile to Link's face, likely reminding him of the words the windfish left him with, thus ending the story and the game. Depending on whether or not the player completed a no-death run, he can also see Marin flying in the distance. But regardless, that's the end. That's Link's Awakening. Before we end the review and get to my final assessment, I want to take this moment to talk about the impact of the game's story on its quality as a whole. This is a first for my reviews, given that every game I've critiqued has, thus far, had absolutely no story to speak of, or in the case of A Link to the Past, simply had no story worth talking about since all it boiled down to was a bunch of fictional history history lessons. But I posit that the story of Link's Awakening is actually worth discussion, because without it, I do not believe that this game would have nearly the same impact on the player that it does with it. For it is the story that contextualizes all of the player's actions, grants weight to his decisions, and ultimately leaves the player with one of the most airtight, succinct titles in all of the Zelda series. So let's take a moment to discuss how it enhances the experience of Link's Awakening, and then we'll get to giving this game its final score. First, let us address the setting. The dream world of Koholint is charming, no doubt. So much work went into filling the island to the brim with lovable, quirky characters and funny little interactions, most of which play on the dream premise of the setting. A village of talking animals, singing frogs, Mario enemies, there are so many characters who should not and could not be in any other Zelda game. In other words, the setting of the story, its most fundamental aspect, feels as though it was fully realized. At no moment did I think, this is nice, but there really is no meaning to the game being set in a dream. Every aspect of the story, 
from the characters to the plot to the themes, feels as though it was tailored around the island of Kohlint, and more broadly, the setting of a dream island in general, which is quite commendable from a writing standpoint. Beyond just the setting itself, the game also manages to fill its world with several specific named characters with personal interactions for the player to discover. Richard, the French nobleman, Madame Meow Meow, the crazy cat lady who instead takes care of two-ton deadly chain chomps, Terran, the shroom addict father of Marin, and of course, my man Mando himself. Sure, these characters are somewhat shallow. Karen enjoys shrooms, the madam enjoys fawning over her pets, and Richard enjoys, uh, being French, I guess. But that doesn't keep them from being charming nonetheless. Especially given all the cute little interactions that the devs took the time to program for each and every one of them. If they were all this game had to its characters, then sure, that wouldn't be much. But that's precisely why this game has its ace in the hole, Marin, who serves as the heart of this game's story. She saves Link when he first washes up on the island. She sings for him and the other villagers in the town square. She expresses her hopes and dreams, but most heartbreaking of all, she is the one who teaches Link how to play the Ballad of the Windfish, effectively giving him the song with which he'll kill her and every other inhabitant on the island of Koholint. The guilt the player might feel when playing the Ballad of the Windfish would already have been bad enough without that fact, but realizing that it's with her song, the one she so kindly shared with Link that you're killing her with, it makes it difficult to go through with it. Perhaps my favorite part of the game is the very end, because instead of just telling the player that waking the windfish will destroy the island and everyone on it, the end cutscene actually takes the time to show him each and every one of Mabe Village's inhabitants being erased during the final performance of the Ballad of the Windfish, ending with the death of Marin herself. The act of waking the windfish almost starts to feel tantamount to mass murder by the end, and all of that despite the characters being figments of the windfish's imagination. How the hell does this game manage to elicit such guilt out of the player through what is otherwise a necessary action required to complete the game? I'll tell you how, by making the characters feel like real fucking people, instead of a bunch of ones and zeros. By having Marin tell you what she wants to do in the future, where she wants to go, who she wants to be, and then having her actions match those desires. Destroying the island and effectively killing her feels like it has such a real impact after seeing her express so many relatable emotions with the player. Sadness, excitement, boredom, joy, love. When we start to think of her in terms of who she is as a character, she ceases to be a simple NPC in a video game made for children, and begins to look like a real person. That's what makes the final performance of this game feel so sad. The knowledge that all of the inhabitants of Koholint will die because you valued Link and the Windfish over the lives of the inhabitants of Koholint. I put some real thoughts into a possible scenario where the game could allow the player to choose an ending. One where Link wakes the Windfish, or one where he decides to live out his days with Marin in the dream world. I've seen this idea posited before as a way of enhancing the ending, and while I do agree that it has the advantage of making the player feel like he really is choosing to kill the inhabitants and the island in the original ending, I feel as though ultimately it would contradict the message of the story. As the Windfish says, it is the nature of all dreams to end. This is indisputably true. No matter how wonderful a dream you might have, it is in its nature to end. Always. The act of awakening from a dream is non-negotiable, and it is only the memory of that dream that can ever remain, if it even does. So to give the player the option to not go through with waking the windfish would be counterintuitive to that message, and would lessen the impact of the windfish's final monologue. Ultimately, the game's ending as is leaves us with a strong message, that the memory of a place, or a person, or event can often be stronger and more tangible than what really happened, and what is really true. None of what happened on Koholint was technically real, but it mattered all the same to Link and the Windfish. Without the act of awakening, this message can never really materialize, so while I understand that some players may not feel like the decision is truly theirs and that can lessen the impact of the story for them, the fact still stands that the choice of awakening really is no one's in the first place, and thus, I believe the themes work even in spite of a lack of player choice over the ending. 
In its totality, the story of this game leaves the player with some serious emotional baggage, coming to terms with the destruction of the dream world and the realization that none of it was even real might be difficult for some. But ultimately, the message of the story is one of hope. One of realizing that sometimes it is what we remember and what we carry with us that matters more than what has actually happened, or what we once had that is now lost. In truth, the island of Koholint was always fake, but to Link, the Windfish, and ultimately the player, it couldn't have felt any more real. That's the impact of fiction. Even if a story or a place or a person is made up, they can end up being more important to us personally than most real people we see every day. This story, in tangent with the gameplay, music, and atmosphere, is why I adore Link's Awakening so much, and why it is personally one of my favorite Zelda games. Hell, it might even be in my top 20 games of all time if I ended up making a list like that. It deserves every bit of praise you'll hear about it, and more. I love this game. But more importantly, when put under an objective, critical lens and put to the test, it comes out on top as perhaps the definitive 2D Zelda experience. A Link to the Past be damned. I give The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening a 9 out of 10. It's a succinct, tightly designed game with plenty of atmosphere, lovable characters, and wonderfully designed levels that complement the fundamental gameplay to a T. Sure, it might have a few hiccups along the way, the dungeon design is not perfect, with Dungeons 4 and 6 in particular being quite lackluster, and if I really had to nitpick, there are a few smaller issues I have yet to mention like repetitive text boxes or power-ups playing the same theme every time you pick them up, thereby interrupting whatever music was playing before. And then there are a few other small issues I did mention, like the piece of heart locations or the ghost side quest. But as a whole, this is a legendary video game that every gamer should give a chance at some point. And more specifically, it is absolutely worth playing for any Zelda fan out there who has yet to experience it. It's the definitive 2D Zelda experience, only rivaled by the original game. But unlike the original, this title also has decent 2D graphics, an amazing and varied soundtrack, and an actual story with some lovable characters. If you call yourself a Zelda fan and haven't played this game yet, get on it, because you've been missing out. Get it on the Switch, the 3DS, the new Game & Watch, or hell, splurge on the original Game Boy cartridge and pop it into your SNES like I did. No matter what way you choose to play this game, do it, and you'll thank me later. And with that, we're done reviewing Link's Awakening. How exciting! Now we get to move on to our first 3D game with Ocarina of Time. It's pretty much all going to be downhill after that one, but I'm at least very excited to review what is objectively the greatest game of all time. Not a joke, and add my two or three hour review to the proverbial pyre of Ocarina of Time reviews on YouTube. Until then, I hope you'll stick around, subscribe, maybe even visit the Patreon page, wink wink nudge nudge, but regardless, thank you all so much for sticking with me for the last two hours or so, and until next time, have yourselves a very nice day.